Well, I invite you to turn into the word of the Lord to Isaiah chapter 24. Uh, please pray with me that this sermon doesn't get away from me one, uh, either, either way uh, as we hold down the notes here. But this is a time we're going to be slowing down a little bit in the book of Isaiah. Uh, we've been going through a pretty fast pace uh, through chapter 13 through 23, these 10 oracles that have been given. Now we come to chapter 24, which is a pivotal chapter. It is uh, the conclusion of those oracles, those 10 oracles, where God is seen as sovereign over all the nations. Uh, We saw that clearly in his judgment of the surrounding nations of Israel, and even of Israel itself, and even of the superpowers of the time, particularly uh, Assyria. But uh, now chapter 24 uh, broadens that, and that judgment is now going to be uh, for the whole world, the whole world. And then it's not just a conclusion to the oracles, but chapter 24 is the beginning of a new section of Isaiah from 24 to 27, uh, this next section, which is uh, an interesting section. Uh, It's uh, been called the little apocalypse of Isaiah or Isaiah's apocalypse, uh, Isaiah's unveiling. And it doesn't have apocalyptic language like the book of Revelation or Ezekiel has. There are no uh, hideous beasts or, or triumphant lambs or, or, or uh, dragons. But we have definitely moved into the future in this chapter. We've definitely uh, left the historical context of Isaiah uh, and these particular nations. And we have entered into eschatology, the end things, the, the end. And so chapter 24 through 27 has been called a little book of Revelation, not because of the type of language it is, but because of the subject matter. It has a final victory over life and death and sin and death. It has different songs of triumph, which you see all through the book of Revelation. And it has a a worldwide feasting uh, that is talked about as Revelation has. And it compares two cities. And this uh, is predominant in, in the, in the pas- passage before us. We have here a, a city that is ruined. It's mentioned in chapter verse 10 and, and 12. It's a city and the city of the world. I think it's metaphoric. It's not talking about a particular city, but it's talking about the city of this world and God's final judgment on uh, the inhabitants. So this is the passage before us. And we slow down, just take one chapter this week. Uh, together. So hear the word of the Lord, and this is the word of the Lord from uh, Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 24. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It would be the same for priest and for people, for master and for servant, for mistress and for maid, For seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up, and our very few are left. The new wine dries up, and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The gaiety of the tambourines is stilled. The noise of the revelers have stopped. The joyful harp is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song. The beer is bitter to its drinkers. The ruined city lies desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. In the streets they cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom. All gaiety is banished from the earth. The city is left in ruins. Its gate is battered to pieces. So will be on the earth and among the nations as when an olive tree is beaten, 
as when a, the gleanings are left and after the grape harvest, they raise their voices. They shout for joy. From the west, they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the islands of the sea. From the ends of the earth, we hear singing, glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away. I waste away. Woe to me, the treacherous betray. With treachery, the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare await you, O people of the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare. The floodgates of the heavens are open. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be hurled, hurled, herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you help us hear this word. It's a difficult word to hear. It's a hard word to hear. And yet it's an important word for us to hear. Because as we compare our salvation to what we would have had without it, we find ourselves in these verses. Oh Lord, for those who have not come to you, Lord, may they hear it in the full impact of this chapter. This morning, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If we were to ask unbelievers why they are not believers, we would probably hear many different things. Maybe things like uh, the church is full of phonies. We might hear something like faith and science don't mix or one religion can't have all the answers or, or Christianity is too restrictive for my taste. But the number one reason that I hear is how can you believe in a God that judges other people for their beliefs? In Tim Keller's wonderful book, and you should read it sometime, it's a wonderful book uh, called The uh, God, uh, Reason for God. And in the chapter, How Can a Loving God Send People to Hell? He quotes different people from his congregation, I believe, a graduate student from Germany who says, I doubt the existence of a judgmental God. Why can't God just forgive? Or a lady who works in, in uh, uh, a gallery in uh, uh, Soho who says, the only God that I believe in is a God of love. And he concludes saying this, he says, our culture has no problem with a God of love who supports us no matter how we live. It, it does, however, object strongly to the idea of a God who punishes people for their sincerely held beliefs, even if they are mistaken. And so because of this, the church has become somewhat squeamish, as Barry uh, Webb put the word, about uh, the judgment of God. And yet here it is, here it is again, a chapter on God's judgment, God's final judgment here. The Bible presents to us not only a loving God, but a righteous God. The Bible presents to us not only a merciful God, but a, but a, but a just God. And in verses 1 through 3, God is warning us that one day the whole earth will be laid bare before him. That's the image. It will shrivel up. It will empty out. It will be picked apart 
as verse 13 adds to the, the metaphor, uh, like an uh, a olive grove that has just been harvested. It is a ruined city that's presented before us. It, it truly will be the end of the world one day as we know it. And, and not for a few, but look at verse 2. It will be for everyone and all. It will be for those, whoever they are, whatever position they have in life, it will be come upon them. This final judgment is as certain as something can certainly be. But this brings us back again to our question, doesn't it? It brings us back to our question. Why? Why will God do this? And verse 5 gives us the answer. Because the earth is defiled. And how is it defiled? It literally means it's polluted. The earth is polluted. And how is it polluted? It's polluted by other people. In other words, the, God, the, the problem is not us. The problem is not God, but it is, it is us. We are the ones who bring this judgment upon ourselves. Why? Because we disobey the laws. We violate the statutes. We break the everlasting covenant. And your question probably would be, what laws and, and what covenant? And the Bible calls a number of covenants uh, everlasting. And we might think here it's talking about the covenant with Noah. It has some parallels to that. But remember, that covenant with Noah can't be broken. It's everlasting, but it can't be broken because God said, I will not judge the world. I will not judge it by a flood once again, but I will bless it until the time of the final judgment. And therefore, this has got to be talking about the covenant with Adam, going back to the very beginning. The covenant of Adam that Hosea mentions, the covenant of creation, this covenant relationship that every person in the world has with their creator. Since we are all created by God, we are all bound to God in covenant. We are all, and therefore it's an everlasting covenant because people are going to live forever somewhere. It's an everlasting covenant that has been broken. You know, even in hell, people are still God's creatures that everyone in some way knows God. We sometimes say, well, do you have a relationship with God? Well, everybody has a relationship with God. The question is, is it a good relationship? Is it a reconciled relationship? Is it a covenantal relationship where he has promised to bless you because you've come under Christ? One person put it this way, the one before whom we shall stand on judgment day will be no stranger. All people will have met him before. And that's sort of true and not true. He is a stranger in some ways to us when we're in sin. But in other ways, in creation ways, we're not. The laws that we break are therefore the ones that we know by nature. We sometimes call this natural law. We know by nature that God alone is to be worshiped. We know by nature that we've been made for him, not for ourselves. We know by nature that God has a right to, to ch tell us what we are to do and how we are to live, that we're to live like him and to follow and walk in his ways. And these written, these, the Bible says these laws are written on every person's heart. We know them and we know him. And to go against then these laws of creation is to ruin creation. And that's why the earth will not work as it's intended if people persist and when people persist to make up their own rules about how they're going to live. This is something that just won't work. Alec Mortier says that human beings in sin are the supreme envir environmental threat. <laughs> I mean, we talk about environmental threats and there are many, but we are really the main one because judgment is inevitable the earth will be judged it will happen at some point and so why does God judge the world why is God a judge to answer our question 
because we deserve it. Because we have broken his laws. We've broken his covenant. God is not the one who has done something wrong here. We're flipping it when we say that it's God that's the mean one and the one that's being hard. We're the ones that have been mean. We're the ones that have turned away from him. And also, God will judge because the world, the world is something that he, the earth is something that the Lord loves and that he must free it one day from its bondage to decay, as Paul says in Romans 8. And that he can't do that without judging the world. And so for the next era to come in, for the next age to come in, judgment must come for God to free creation from its bondage to decay. Tim Keller went on to say in that article or chapter, he said, the Bible says that God's wrath flows from his love and delight in his creation. It doesn't flow from an orneriness. It doesn't flow from a stubbornness. It doesn't flow from a meanness. It flows from his love and his delight in his creation that he will save and is promised to save in the end. If you'd like to take a look at an interesting book besides the Keller book, look at Joshua Butler's book, Skeletons in God's Closet, where he deals with many of the objections that our culture has to God being a judgmental God. And he says, we need God to address the brutality of our history. And he brings up Cain and Abel, the biblical uh, where Cain kills Abel. And he says, as Cain takes the life out of his brother, as he steals Abel's, uh, as, he, as death steals Abel's cries from Cain's ears. In other words, his ears, he can't hear him anymore, he's dead. But in God's eyes, in God's ears, those cries are still going forth. And that still goes on. He goes on to say, God has big ears, ears that are hurting. He is the lover of justice who cries and and hears the cries of all this sin-struck, war-torn world. And God's judgment is, is good news because the injustices will not be forgotten. God hears the cries and one day will act upon those cries of all history, will act upon them in righteous judgment. And even those who hate him will receive some type of of re- reper- uh, not repercussion, but re- redemption, not redemption, uh, what's another hard word? They'll receive some uh, satisfaction by the fact that God will right the wrongs that have been committed even against them in a sinful world. Well, the first point, I have six of them there, there for you. The first point is certainly that the judgment is certain. The second point, is that judgment is deserved. And the third point, verses 7 through 13, is that judgment is joyless. It is joyless for those who receive it. And the picture is given here of a city that has lost its ability to rejoice. Did you see that? The wine has dried up. The comedians have all gone to to groaning. The musicians have packed up their instruments and the singers have lost their voice. And the beer just stinks. It just has no goodness at all in it. Notice that the doorways home are all blocked. People can't even get back into their own houses. This is a ruined city. And it's an interesting Hebrew word. Pastors sometimes can go off and, on words and whatnot. But this is really important because the ruinness there in verse 10, that word ruin means Formless. It's the same word in Genesis 1-2 when it said that the earth was formless and void. In other words, the earth was not, is in chaos. And now here he takes the same word and says this city is formless and void. It's, it's reverted to chaos. It's lost its, its purpose. It's a city without God's creative presence anymore. It's a city with, with no life in it whatsoever. It's a ghost town. All is silent. Did you hear that? As silent as the grave. I read on the internet this week and heard that, that hell was where the, 
heart he is. Nothing can be further from the truth than that. Hell is not a party. Even though all there will believe a similar thing, and all will be still rebelling against God, it is not going to be a party. It's going to be dark. And anything that's good is going to be gone because the presence of God will be gone. People are not celebrating even their, uh, their sinfulness. They're, 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 they're miserable, the Bible says. Jesus' favorite phrase for hell was wailing and gnashing of teeth. No one will be rejoicing there. People will live out life, even eternal life, without God and without good. But from this scene and from this silence, look again, Isaiah starts to hear the distant voices coming from the east and from the west. To see the big change as I read the text there, there's the ruined city, and then you, you start hearing this from both directions. They, and it, this, this noise gets louder and louder from the distance of the, uh, and Brun comes in. And you have to picture this. It's as dramatic as any uh, stage production. They are singing. They are shouting for joy. Who are these people? They are the few of verse 6. They are the remnant of God, the saved. They are the survivors of judgment. These are the new citizens of a lasting city, the new citizens of the new earth. They sing the new song of a new creation, the song of those saved by grace. And so the silence of the ruined city gives way to the songs of the new society. Just when we think all is lost in this passage and that no one is saved, we hear the voices of the nations. Just when we think that the end of the earth has come, we hear from the ends of the earth this new song approaching. And what are they singing? Look at that. They're singing a song about the Lord. What do they say about him? What do they sing about him? They sing two things. One, verse 14, they acclaim his majesty. In other words, they're saying he is God. There is no other. What the citizens of the ruined city would never say. And what they will never for all eternity say is they will glory in his majesty. No, they'll never say that. But these coming, these, this remnant will sing for joy. And they'll glory in what? They'll glory in his, his righteousness. They'll glory in his righteousness. They say... He has done a righteous thing. We see that throughout the scriptures that God's people see in the end that the judgment of God is righteous. It's the right thing to do. At some point, judgment will be the right thing for God to do. Only God knows when that is. But at some point, it will be right to punish the rebellious. God will not let evil go on in his world forever. He will stop it one day. He will hear the voices of the oppressed. He will come in judgment. And he will save at that moment all those who love him. All those who know that they are not righteous in themselves, but they need uh, the gift of righteousness, his gift of righteousness. All those who know the Lord is our righteousness. You see, these people that are coming from east and west are God's elect, God's people that have been righteously made new through God's power, who have been righteously declared righteous because of a righteous one who comes, even Jesus. Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God. It's a gift from God and is by faith, Paul says. Or in Romans, he says, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
You can be totally righteous in God's sight this morning by believing in Jesus Christ. God is the righteous one, and not only he shows his righteousness in his righteous and rightful judgment, but his righteousness is shown in his salvation, that he comes for his own one day. And then ultimately, Jesus gives us this righteousness because he's earned that righteousness for us. He's earned it by living the life that we should live for us, and by dying to gain that righteousness so that we might have it and belong to him forever. And so God judges in righteousness, but he also saves through righteousness. Judgment is redemptive because without it, there is no salvation for God's people. But look at verse 16. We're not there yet. And Isaiah knows it. And this is why he says, I'm wasting away. This is why he says, I'm, I'm still in a sinful world. Remember in chapter 6 of Isaiah, he said, woe is me before God, before he became and realized he was righteous in Christ. Now, now he says, woe to me. He realizes the treachery is still in this world. And literally in the Hebrew, he says, for betrayers betray with betrayal, betrayers, betrayers betray. He just emphasizes this betrayal. People are, are, are being, uh, betraying the God that made them and then they're betraying one another. It's the horizontal and the, and the vertical going on of our sin. But then he comes back to his theme. He can't stop his theme. He just jumps back into it in verse 18. Judgment is, is certain to come. You can run but not hide is really what he's saying. You can run, fall into a pit. Maybe you'll get out of the pit, but a snare will get you in the end. You can't get away from the Lord. The judgment, number five of our message, is unavoidable without Jesus. Notice how he says to get away would be like surviving another flood. It would be like walking when the earth is full of, of cracks and, and fissures and you can't even find your footing. It would be like walking through a hurricane is what he says here. In verse 21 he says, even the highly powers of the demons, probably a reference in verse 21, and the earthly powers, no matter how, what powers there are, they all will be punished, there's no escape. Even the most powerful creature on earth or in heaven will be judged. There's going to be no payoffs. There's going to be no backroom deals. There's going to be no uh, judgment dodgers. You can't get away from it. You must face the Lord. I must face the Lord. But look sixthly and finally at verse 23. Judgment in the end will give glory to God. That's what that's saying. And you might say, how can judgment give glory to God? It seems like it would just be dirty work. He'd have to get a, out of the way. But it actually brings glory to God to judge the nations. Well, look at how, well, how Isaiah expresses it. He says the sun, literally the hot one in Hebrew, or the moon, literally the white one or silver one, are ashamed. Uh, the ESV has confounded the, or embarrassed the sun and moon uh, have lost their luster in the comparison to God in his glory. In the face of God's brilliance and splendor, they're saying, we're, we're nothing compared to you, Lord. We're nothing compared to you. God's glory outshines everything when he comes. And Isaiah comes, to, we'll get to this in chapter 60, verse 19. He says, the sun in the final day will no more be your light by day, in chapter 60, verse 19. Nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Here we even share in this magnificence of the glory of God. Revelation, in similar, in chapter 21, 23, the city there, the new Jerusalem, does not need the sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. 
the end of the world will show forth the glory of God and its maker. Now, how does judgment bring glory to God? A lot of people are going to be devastated on that day. How can that bring glory to God? As you've seen, though, it's not God's fault that they will be devastated on that day. Their undoing is their own doing. And Paul brings this up in, in Romans chapter 9. He hints at this. He says, what if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy? You see, everyone, a saved person and an unsaved person, will glorify God for all eternity. The unsaved will glorify God's godness, will glorify God's righteousness and justice. The saved person will glorify God's grace and mercy and his undying love. But both will glorify God in very different ways. One willingly, the other unwillingly. You see, the saved should be the unsaved. <laughs> and the unsaved should never be saved. If you come, you see, if you come to God from the presumption that everyone should be saved and that God should now, after we've broken the covenant and after we've done one thing after another, day after day, hour by hour, then you'll never understand grace. You'll never understand the true God. You'll never understand salvation in Christ. You'll never love God. He'll always be a monster to you. But that's not reality. Reality is that, that no one should be saved in the first place. No one deserves it at all. It's all by God's grace. And this can, can cause us great heartache as believers because we realize we've done nothing to deserve this. We can only trace back that God loves us for no reason other than his own reasons. And if that should not humble us, if that should not call us to further obedience and love for God, nothing will. Ray Ortland put it well. He said, what will heaven and hell have in common? What they have in common is that everyone in heaven and hell will be a tribute to, in heaven will tri be tribute to his grace and everyone in hell will be a witness to his justice. But everyone will bring honor to God. What then is the difference between heaven and hell? The difference is that the people in heaven will be delighting in God's glory and the people in hell will be raging and shrieking against his glory. The way we will experience God forever will come out of our own hearts. I really believe that. We don't need to think of hell as something God is doing to people. As God's... Uh, I'm getting back at you. Hell is a place where people want to go for all the wrong reasons. As C.S. Lewis put it, hell is locked and the gate and, and lock of hell is on the inside, not on the outside. Woody Allen and his film Crimes and Misdemeanors a character says, in fact, we are, in fact, the sum total of our choices. And those in hell will be the sum total of their choices. They chose not to love the God who is reaching out to them in love through the gospel. They chose not to, to love the God who has made them and given them everything they have. So everyone will glorify God in the end. Why not glorify God by being His? Why not glorify God by receiving His grace even today as it's offered to you in the gospel? What are you waiting for, my friend? Why do you stand on the outside looking in? And you could come in today 
you trust Christ even today. You know, in the end, people will have their own will, their own way. And that's the hideousness of sin. That sin makes people, it would make all of us love ourselves over God, love even hell over heaven. That's the, the, the idiocy of, of sin. That's the, that's the trap that holds people back. Oh, hear the gospel today. Hear the gospel. There's a story, and I'll end with this, of Calvin Coolidge. I think I've told you this before, a favorite story of his. He was vice president ruling the Senate uh, in the sense of governing over it and moderating it. And one day the, the Senate got a little nasty and people were yelling at each other and calling each other's names and one senator said to the other senator to go to hell. And the one that was told that marched down the aisle, came before Calvin Coolidge and said, did you hear what he said to me? Coolidge in his quick wit said, I've looked at the rules and you don't have to go. You don't have to go. And that's so, so, so true. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. It's only yourself and your pride and your stubbornness that would keep you from heaven. Oh, come to this Savior who is glowing with righteousness, who will give you a total covering, a total righteousness. Right now, if you will receive it by faith and trust that that Jesus, he, he was much more than a teacher. He was much more than a good guy. He was a savior and the savior who earned my righteousness for me that I might be holy and righteous in God's sight and never face the judgment. He took the judgment for us. Trust him today. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us. When we talk of such things, of hell, we know it's only your grace that would keep us from that. We know it's only you and your great love that would keep these things from happening to us. Oh, may we hide ourselves in thee. May we come and be covered with your righteousness, receiving it today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.